Hello, I'm Vanessa Harding. I'm Professor of London History at Birkbeck in the University of London. I'm a historian of London and plague, and today in the festival Shakespeare Buenos Aires, I'm going to be talking about plague in Shakespeare's London. My title, Where the Infectious Pestilence Did Reign, Plague in Shakespeare's London, um, I'm sure some of you will recognise that it's a quotation from Romeo and Juliet, and it comes in the unfortunate Friar John's explanation of why he was unable to deliver Lock Friar Lawrence's letter. The searchers of the town, suspecting what, that we both were in a house where the infectious pestilence did reign, sealed up the doors and would not let us forth. Although the action of course takes place in Italy, there is an assumption that a London audience would understand the conjunction of plague or pestilence, searchers, and the practice of shutting up or quarantining those suspected of infection. And this assumption was well founded because plague and the memory of plague loomed large in Shakespeare's London. It had been a feature of London life for two and a half centuries and it was very active in the period of Shakespeare's intermittent sojourns in London between about 1590 and 1615. So while plague in this period is less well documented than the Great Plague of 1665, we have no Samuel Pepys or Daniel Defoe, the topic of plague isn't quickly exhausted. There's a substantial modern literature on the subject, beginning with F.P. Wilson's The Plague in Shakespeare's London, published in 1925, which still has considerable value. And I acknowledge my debt to him and to modern historians of plague, especially Paul Slack. So in this lecture, I'm focusing on London and the wider narrative of plague, rather than on Shakespeare and his possible experiences, however influential they might have been on his writing. I'll outline first the broad history of plague in London, and then the specifics of the period 1590 to 1615, official responses to the plague and what they reveal about contemporary understandings of the disease. And finally, I'll discuss some of the unofficial reactions and responses. So historic plague, the era of the second pandemic opened in Europe in 1347 with the devastating epidemic commonly known as the Black Death. It hit London in late 1348 and it killed a third to a half of the city's population in the next two or three years. And it made two or three quite severe returns before 1400. After that, it seems to have changed to a pattern of periodic but less severe outbreaks through the 15th and early 16th centuries. From the mid 16th century, when London itself was growing rapidly, plague epidemics are better documented, but also it seems more deadly, capable of killing up to a sixth or more of the population though without sapping London's overall growth. By this time, plague, plague was largely an urban disease. Though it certainly spread from town to town, it didn't envelop the whole country at one moment. Hence the possibility for the playing companies of touring the provinces, even while the London theatres were closed. Over the period 1563 to 1665, perhaps 200,000 people died of plague in London accounting for up to a sixth of all deaths in the period. In this 102 years, there were five major epidemics, one less severe and several periods of raised plague mortality. It's important to note that while plague often disappeared after a single terrible year, on two or three occasions it lingered, killing a significant number over several consecutive years, but never flaring into a citywide epidemic. After the 1665 epidemic, the one that most people know about, plague effectively disappeared from London and the disease gradually retreated from Europe. Over the years, there's been considerable debate over the identification of the disease that early modern Londoners called plague. 16th and 17th century physicians and other writers described the disease they encountered and its symptoms, fever, sweating, lumps or buboes in the neck, armpits or groin, spots or tokens spread over the body. They noted its seasonality and predicted its likely course in the individual patient. 
They identified a number of direct and contributory causes in their pursuit of prevention and cure, but the general view was that it was caused by a venomous or poisonous miasma that invaded the body. Confident diagnosis of a specific pathogen and mode of transition wasn't made until the late 19th century. The identification of bubonic plague, the Bacillus Yersinia pestis, and the rat and rat flea vectors as responsible for the third pandemic in East and South Asia seemed to solve the question of the Black Death and early modern European plagues and influenced almost a century of writing on the subject. Identifying a pathogen was obviously important, but paradoxically, it seriously muddied the waters for critical examination of historic plague. Historians and others seized on the rat flea vector and retrospectively explained all past plague epidemics in those terms. And as this image shows, uh, this is an imaginative drawing uh, picture from the early 20th century showing the hand of death and rats running away from dying people. Only some time later did researchers highlight the substantial inconsistencies between the characteristics and behaviours of the pre-modern and modern diseases, such as the speed of spread and levels of mortality, and difficulties with the rat flea mode of transmission. For example, the characteristics and distribution of the rat population. This led some to reject the received wisdom that Yersinia pestis was responsible, postulating other pathogens. Others were agnostic about the pathogen while continuing to argue for a more cautious and critical interpretation of the historical evidence. More recently, in recent years, uh, analysis of ancient DNA in bodies in known plague burial sites from the 14th to the 17th centuries has confirmed the presence of Yersinia pestis, indicating that it was the most that it was likely the most significant cause of the second pandemic. However, this isn't the end of the inquiry. It answers one question, but leaves open many others. It doesn't necessarily help us to understand the impact and significance of the disease any better. And it remains the case that historic plague fails in many ways to conform to the epidemiology of modern bubonic plague. It may also not have been the only active pathogen. Contemporaries spoke of diseases akin to, but not identical with plague, and noted the great increase in spotted fever and other fevers in plague years. So when we're looking at the disease that Shakespeare and his contemporaries knew, we should be cautious about thinking that we understand it much better than they did, and certainly about criticizing the steps they took to control or contain it. So Shakespeare's London had thus known plague over a long period. Many older adults would still have recalled the Great Plague of 1563, in which a fifth to a quarter of the capital's population died. There had been minor epidemics in 1578 and 1582, though actually minor doesn't mean negligible, each of them killed over 3,000 people or 1 to 2% of London's likely population. The later 1580s seem to have seen irregular short cycles of elevated mortality in which plague certainly played some part. Both 1592 and 1593 were epidemic years with total mortality over 10,000 in 1592 and nearly 20,000 in 1593. There was significant local variation. St. Bot of Oldgate to the east of the city was twice as badly hit as St. Martin in the Fields to the west in 1593. The disease then seems to have died away almost completely for a decade, but returned in greater force in 1603. Concern about plague in Southwark in March and April 1603 was followed by more widespread infection in the city and liberties north of the river, to the extent that the celebrations for King James's arrival and coronation largely bypassed the city. Weekly death totals increased sharply from mid-July and total deaths had reached 32,300 32, with 27,000 of plague by early October. Figures for the whole year approached 40,000 with over 30,000 dying of plague. If, as is generally believed, London's population was around 200,000 at this time, this implies a mortality approaching 20%. However, 
unlike 1563 or 1593, the epidemic of 1603 was not followed by a respite for Londoners, but by seven or eight years of continuing serious plague incidents. 1604 and 1605 saw some hundreds of plague deaths, but between 1606 and 1611, over 13,000 Londoners died of plague. 1609 was the worst year, with over 4,000 plague deaths. Plague deaths normally peaked in late September in these years, but they continued through the winter months. However, after 1611, plague deaths trailed off, average, averaging less than 20 a year in the following decade. It's perhaps significant that the period 1603 to 1611 saw the burgeoning of literature of plague in English, as well as the first of Thomas Decker's plague pamphlets. Decker's comment in 1606 that the city was threatened by that desolation, which now for three years together have hovered round about you, suggests that plague was mostly located in the parishes outside the walls, though these were also the fastest growing parts of the metropolis. The burial registers of peripheral parishes such as Clerkenwell indicate sustained high mortality through the period, and several suburban parishes found it necessary to open new burial grounds in, these, in this decade. The continuing high plague mortality in London is important because it reminds us that it was an ever-present fear, not the more remote one of an epidemic that might return at some future date. And it placed an ongoing strain on public finances, especially at parish level, where authorities were learning to operate the rate-based Elizabethan poor law, which, mit which mandated relief when, the, when necessary for settled residents. So how did officialdom respond? The City of London had a coherent and rational response to plague, an emergency plan activated at the onset or feared onset of an epidemic. The plague orders derived from the Crown and the Privy Council, and they were informed by medical thinking, including French and Italian practice, but they were imposed and enforced by the city authorities. They were issued first as proclamations and later as multi-page booklets printed by the king's or the city's printer. The broad principles and provisions of the orders were established by the later 16th century, and though some of the text and provisions varied over time, the core prescriptions remained the same. They covered points such as a survey of visited or infected houses, searching or inspecting all dead to determine the cause of death, 28-day quarantine of infected houses and their occupants, limiting trips to buy provisions to one person from each household who had to carry a red wand three foot long, the destruction of clothes and household stuff from infected houses, street cleaning, killing stray dogs, and the restriction of assemblies, including public burials and stage plays. Bodies were to be buried six feet, 1.8 meters deep, and were not to be kept in church during service time, though there was no general restriction on burial inside churches. One of the most ubiquitous textual manifestations of plague was the labelling of infected houses. The 1583 orders required a paper with the words, Lord have mercy upon us, to be put up over the door of infected houses, which was not to be defaced or taken down. And this phrase became embedded in stories about plague and in the broadside literature. Although they formed the basis of the official response to plague, it's clear that the orders were not always effectively implemented. Household quarantine was particularly hard to enforce without substantial resources. Nor did the orders cover every eventuality. There was a stream of further proclamations in plague years, exhorting observation of the orders and adding new instructions. Minutes of the city's court of aldermen document other activities, including the appointment of physicians and surgeons, dealing with the city's pest houses, and sporadic efforts to solve the city's burial problem. Much of the responsibility was devolved to the local level. The City of London's 26 aldermen, each responsible for a geographical ward, were instructed to summon their deputy and all church wardens, constables, parish clerks, sextons and beadles within his ward to inquire what houses were visited or infected. Two substantial and discreet citizens were to be appointed in every parish, chosen by the aldermen of the ward, to be surveyors of those 
of those orders and to see them observed. Likewise, every parish was to appoint two sober conscientious women to search or view the bodies of those sick or suspected of infection and to report plague deaths to the constable. The searches in Romeo and Juliet sound more like the surveyors of London, of the, of the London plague orders than the women searchers. The constables were to deliver daily updates on infections to the surveyors and the aldermen, and either the constable or the searchers were to report deaths to the parish clerk, who was to inform the clerk of the parish clerk's company, who issued the official report. Alongside these responsibilities mandated by the plague orders, the individual parishes employed and paid grave diggers, bearers of the dead, nurses for the sick, and guards for quarantined houses, as well as providing monetary relief for households unable to support themselves under quarantine and paying the burial fees and funeral expenses of the poor. The larger, poorer parishes on the periphery of London bore the brunt of immigration, plague mortality, and poverty but the city authorities did collect and distribute money from wealthier Londoners. The plague orders and the city's other activities give a good idea of official thinking about the disease. It's clear that they believed the infection could be passed from person to person and that those who'd had contact with the diseased or with the dead could themselves infect others before or without succumbing to the disease themselves. Quarantining the sick or potentially sick was therefore believed to be vital and shutting up of houses, though it was controversial and certainly resisted, remained a key element in the city's strategy. Congregations of people were to be avoided. Likewise, the clothing and bedding of the sick were a lingering potential source of infection and must be treated with care or preferably destroyed. And certainly they mustn't be allowed to circulate as before. Some broader environmental concerns were addressed. Dirt and rubbish in the streets could infect the air, so householders were required to clean in front of their houses and rakers appointed to remove the waste. A major concern of the Elizabethan and early Stuart authorities was the rapid expansion of London as a result of immigration, with the ensuing overcrowding and jerry building and implied dangers to health and the social order. London's population had doubled between the 1560s and 1600, the result of an unceasing flow of migrants from, from provincial England and beyond. Proclamations to stop London's growth by banning new building and subdivision were issued from the 1580s, but evidently to little effect. The implication of this for plague infection was noted in October 1593, when the Privy Council wrote to the steward and bailiffs of Westminster that, in this late visitation of the plague and grievous sickness, we are of opinion that the greatest number for the most part are dead out of such houses as were pestered with inmates. And inmates at this time means lodgers or temporary residents. They ordered the officers diligently to inquire without going into the infected houses, which houses had taken in lodgers or inmates, and also to prevent the replacement of the dead with new tenants. Concern about overcrowding and its propensity for breeding disease continued through the 17th century. Early modern writers were certainly critical of accumulations of dirt and rubbish, poor street cleaning and improper burial practices, but their concerns focused on the effect these had on air quality, a major factor in health, and on the possible contamination of water and foodstuffs. An infected, corrupted and putrefied air was identified as one of two especial causes of the pestilence in 1603. And a treatise of 1593 cited an array of environmental ills contributing to the spread of plague, including stinking dung hills, filthy and standing pools of water, and unsavory smells near the places where we dwell. So he also noted climatic factors, both great heat and great rains, and unburied, unburied bodies after battles. There was also a more general tendency to blame the living habits of the poor for their contribution to the disease. The chronicler John Stowe's use of the term pestered to denote overcrowding and alley building in the near suburbs is telling. So in his survey of 1598, St. Catherine's by the Tower was described as pestered with small tenements. Aldgate High Street was pestered with diverse alleys. <clears throat> 
and outside Bishopsgate, from Bethlehem Hospital northwards, upon the street side, many houses have been builded with alleys backward, of late time too much pestered with people, a great cause of infection, up to the bars, that is, up to the city limits. Among the plague provisions most relevant to Shakespeare and the playing companies was, of course, the closure of the theatres. It's well known that the city's governors were hostile to stage plays on both moral and governmental grounds. They wrote to Walsingham in May 1583 that the assembly of people to, bear, to plays, bear baiting, fences and profane spectacles at the theatre and curtain and other like places was a great cause of infection, attributing this both to the mingling of the basest sort of people, some of them infected with sores running on them, as well as to the terrible occasioning of God's wrath and heavy striking with plagues. So the 1583 orders accordingly restrained interludes or plays, assemblies, fences, or other profane spectacles. The looming epidemic of 1603 prompted the closure of the playhouse, playhouses from 17th of May to the 9th of April, 1604. A warrant of 1604 prescribed that playing should cease if the weekly total of plague deaths across the city reached 30, though this threshold was revised upwards to 40 in 1608. This should have meant that the theatres were closed from early July to mid-November, and more briefly on occasion in the winter and spring, in every year from 1606 to 1610, and there's some evidence both for prosecutions for disobeying the orders and for compensation paid to the players. The mayor and aldermen were keen to keep the theatres closed during this extended period of plague, writing to the Lord Chamberlain in April 1607, informing him of the increase of the plague in the skirts and confines of the city, which was likely to spread through the great heat of the season, and requesting that all stage plays might be interdicted. Over the 16th century, attempts to document plague mortality on a, systemic, on a systematic basis, intended originally just to inform the authorities, evolved into the printed weekly bills of mortality, summaries of deaths and plague deaths by parish, published as broadsides or handbills. Their early history is complex and not always well understood, but by the 17th century, the weekly publication of the bills had become a regular feature of London life. They were compiled by the parish clerk's company from returns from individual parishes and printed under strict protocols to ensure that information went first to the Crown and the Privy Council and to the City of London before being made available to the public. In the period we're looking at, their format and coverage were still evolving, but the simple principle of dividing London's parishes by area and identifying deaths and plague deaths were already established. The weekly bills reported on London within the walls, London without the walls and within the liberties, that is 16 parishes wholly or partly within the city's jurisdiction, from St Andrew Hoban to St Botolph Aldgate, and the four parishes in Southwark, and the out parishes adjoining to the city, which included St. Martin in the Fields, Shoreditch and Bermondsey. The bills have two columns for deaths, buried in all and of the plague. They also give a figure for parishes clear and parishes infected and for christenings in the city parishes. So the reader of the bill could thus quickly grasp both the chronology and geography of infection and draw conclusions about likely developments. The bills rapidly became an important source of information for the public, avidly read and speculated upon. The letter writer John Chamberlain noted on the 12th of October 1605, this sudden rising of the sickness to 30 a week and the infecting, infecting of 19 parishes, and then the abating of some few this week, and he could only have obtained this data from reading the weekly bills. On the 15th of July 1608, he reported that our bill is risen this week to 162, whereof 26 of the plague. And he continued to relay, relay figures explicitly from the bills to his correspondence through 1608 and 1609. His use of the weekly bill uh, for information about the pattern of infections and deaths is still more marked in the great epidemic of 1625. Personal responses to uh, the presence of plague varied according to circumstance and character. And an obvious one, if you could afford it, 
was simply to leave London. The best remedy for plague was flight. A 16th century treatise argued that, quote, the three adverbs, kito, longe, tarde, leave quickly, go far off, return slowly, are better than three apothecary's shops well stocked. In July 1603, Chamberlain noted that the sickness, sickness increaseth so fast upon us that he determined to make all the haste I can out of town, for it grows hot here, rather than tarrying for the coronation, the imminent coronation. The plague orders allowed those with two houses to leave their sick in one and to move to the other. Magistrates were expected to stay at their posts, but private men could leave as long as their dependents and other social obligations were provided for. But the selfish abandonment of London in its trouble was resented by many, as Decker's pamphlet, A Rod for Runaways, published in 1625, suggests. The practice seems to have grown in the late 16th century, resulting in a marked shift in the geographical focus of plague mortality between the epidemics of 1563 and 1603. Parishes in the centre of the walled city, where the richer sort lived, were badly hit in 1563, but much less severely affected in 1603, while parishes just inside and just outside the wall retur returned much higher figures than before. But escape was not limited to the rich. Obviously, many people needed to stay in London as it was their source of livelihood, their network of support. But for those without ties or employment, or simply those in great fear, flight was a tempting possibility. In August 1603, it was reported that notwithstanding the plague orders set down, there come Londoners from infected places into cottages all about London and bring their bedding and stuff with them. It was impossible to police or turn them back, given the fear of infection. And some, of course, left London only to die in the country. Burials in villages surrounding London increased in epidemic years, well beyond the normal population. The parish register of Kensington, for example, noted of 1603, in this year was the Great Plague, and recorded three or four times as many burials as in preceding years. In Hampstead, it was noted that divers come out of the town and die under hedges or in the fields. Others come in men's yards and outhouses if they be open and die there. For those unable to physically evade the plague, there was an array of advice and prescription. The College of Physicians remained the official source of medical advice and prescription, though they were essentially private practitioners, primarily responsible to their individual patients, unless they were explicitly retained by the city to advise on public health measures. The prevalent Galenic medical theory to which the college subscribed largely saw the problem as one of internal balance and resistance to disease at the level of the individual. The unpredictable incidence of plague, taking some and sparing others, even in the same household, seemed to support this view. Remedies, both official and unofficial, therefore tended to focus on prevention, how to resist the infection entering the body, as well as cure, how to eliminate it if infected. Recommendations included balancing humours through diet, relieving excess through bleeding, purging and emetics, and using fumes and perfumes to dissipate bad airs. Most of them were based on herbal or vegetable products, though the new chemical or mineral-based Paracelsian medicine had some proponents, as well as more magical items such as charms and amulets. There was an outpouring of written evidence. Surviving examples, including Simon Kelway's Defensative Against the Plague of 1593, Thomas Thayer's Treatise of the Pestilence, also 1603, James Manning's New Book of the Pestilence of 1604, James Barmford's Dialogue Concerning the Plague's Infection, 1603, and Thomas Cogan's Haven of Health with a Preservation from the Pestilence of 1605. And in addition to these, there was also very likely a large number of handbills and broadsheets, either prescribing remedies or advertising practitioners and patent remedies. Cheap to print, but ephemeral in nature, these ones are much less likely to survive. However, of equal or greater importance in the view of many was the spiritual aspect of plague. The first cause of plague was divine judgment and the first response 
must be repentance and amendment. Several of the plague prescriptions, plague publications, alternated prescriptions for spiritual with bodily health. So the King's Medicines for the Plague, first issued in 1604 and republished in 1630, another plague year, alternated remedies for plague of the body, take sage of virtue, rue, otherwise called herb grace, elder leaves, with remedies for plague of, of, the, of the soul. Take the herb of virtue, which is the doing of good, Psalm 34, and the herb of patience, otherwise called a waiting upon the Lord, Psalm 37, and so on. Books of prayers and sermons reflecting on the causes and proper responses to the epidemic were also popular. And indeed, works of spiritual and medical advice are often hard to tell apart from their titles. So, for example, An Approved Medicine Against the Deserved Plague, published in 1593, focuses entirely on moral and spiritual matters, offering forms of prayer rather than medical remedies. The popularity of the weekly bills of mortality, which I've already mentioned, prompted a proliferation of publications drawing on that data. In 1603, the city printer John Windit, who had the license to print the standard format weekly bills, also printed a series of composite bills with the total for the current week, weekly totals of deaths to date, plus information on deaths from 1593. Other printers and publishers followed suit, adding information on mortality in other places and on historic plagues. The booklet London's Mourning Garment or Funeral Tears Shed for the Death of Her Wealthy Citizens appears to appends totals of deaths from to, to date to, it was published on the 17th of November 1603, to a lengthy moralizing poem and a godly and zealous prayer to God for the surceasing of his awful plague. And these composite bills are predecessors to a genre that became popular from 1625, combining numbers, images, other useful information such as medical advice and prayers, and sometimes space for the reader to add weekly death totals going forward. So finally, just as early modern Londoners were prompted by their own experience of plague to look at earlier epidemics, so the present epidemic, the present pandemic, has aroused interest in historic plague. It seems likely that more research and writing about this period and topic will emerge, and for the first time, perhaps, modern writers will be tackling the subject with first-hand experience of a pandemic. We've all learned critical lessons in the past year about information, expertise, trust, and the presentation of data, about the interaction of epidemic disease and inequality, about the stress and challenge for those on the front line of response, about the balance of prevention versus other ills. And it will be interesting to see what new insights into historic plagues emerge from this. Thank you so much, Vanessa. It's, 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 it's amazing and it's, it's so interesting. I was wondering, well, nowadays we have a health system, right? Like, like in England, uh, the NHS, but uh, how uh, did a regular family uh, manage to survive? You talked about private doctors, but also I was wondering, um, uh, dealing with this kind of uh, uh, pandemic uh, in those days uh, with, with, with a baby, for instance. Well, it, it does sound, I mean, Babies were, were at huge risk anyway. I mean, there's huge infant mortality in London at this time. It doesn't actually look as though it was much worse in these circumstances. I mean, clearly it would be really bad for them if the mother of a young child died. Um, it doesn't look as though babies and small children were worse affected than other parts of the population. But it's always difficult to do this because we don't know exactly what the composition of the population was. It looks as though there were an awful lot of young adults, the result of you know, migration for apprenticeship and service and so on. So it's not surprising that those make up the majority of the people dying. It's very difficult to say whether people acquired immunity to the plague. And this then takes us back to all that stuff about epidemiology. Um, and you know, I just basically, I don't want to go there because I think there's too much, you know, there's too much speculation that you can't say anything, you, know, you really can't sort it out. Um, I mean, clearly there are people who have survived 
previous plagues, you know, still living in London. But it's also true that, that a major plague does cause a significant change in the population. Um, what's in a way surprising is the way people continually flow to London, despite the fact that it is obviously a centre of disease and, uh, and mortality. I mean, it goes on growing enormously during this period. Um, and that's, it, I suppose the point is that it means that, that people see its opportunities as outweighing the risks. And, and do you find links between uh, those plagues and, and uh, the way we are behaving now with, with the uh, current pandemic that we're going through? Well, I think, I think some of the things I was saying at, at the very end that um, people find it difficult to balance the prevention with other, with other ills. So for example, you know, shutting families up in infected households is very unpopular, but it probably has some impact overall. But there's a, there's a huge literature of resistance to, to the policies of shutting up. Um, some who say, well, it means that everybody in the house dies. That's actually not the case. Um, there are obviously examples when that happens, but uh, certainly from slightly later in the century, it looks as though, you know, when houses are reopened, it isn't that everybody, it isn't because everybody there has died, it's that there have been no more deaths over a period of time. So I think, I think there are clashes of view about what, about the steps that are taken to control the disease. Um, and there's also, I think also quite a strong sense that this is some, this is some, something that government should be taking action on. Um, so it's not everyone for themselves, the government is both imposing order and orders, but also is, um, as we're distributing resources or, or to some extent, um, supporting those who are in greater difficulty. Uh, I mean, it, although the rich do leave London, as I said, there's a very strong feeling that they mustn't do so without, as we were, paying their local rates or leaving um, uh, the, the kind of charitable donations that they would have made had they been in London. Um, and there are collections in other parts of the country when plague hits a particular town. Though the difficulty with London is that everybody sees London as um, not deserving of their charity because it's so big and so rich and so dominant, you know, rather in the same way that it is now. Yeah, and I was wondering how uh, did they deal with all those dead bodies? Uh... Well, the... I mean, plague burial is a major question. In, in the um, 14th century epidemic, they opened new, completely new burial grounds on the outskirts of London and buried thousands of people there. During these epidemics, um, they tend to bury in parish churchyards as much as they can. Um, it's clear that 1563 puts a big strain on this. And in 1569, the city opens a new burial ground that they call the new churchyard outside Bishopsgate. And that's used quite a lot by parishes that would normally bury in a local burial ground, you know, in their own churchyard. Um, and it takes quite a while for the churchyards to recover. The, uh, and they do, and the practice of burial has to move in at least some places from digging individual graves and filling them one by one to digging large pits. And this is one of the things that Decker goes on about um, and that they dig mass burial trenches or pits and fill them uh, basically by piling the bodies in. I mean, it's always difficult to know how much De Decker is exaggerating or whether Decker is exaggerating, but the idea that bodies are being carried out of the city and laid in these um, suburban burial grounds, again, mostly they are mostly consecrated burial grounds, not, they're not just burying in the fields, um, or most of them are not burying in the fields. Uh, but it is a real strain. And it's interesting that the larger suburban parishes um, in the decade from, well, it's two decades from sort of 1600 to 1620, a lot of them open new burial grounds. And I think this is partly because their own population has grown, but also because they've suffered this huge plague mortality. So, 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 so they were not used to cremate the bodies. They never do that. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's it's an absolute no no. Um, I mean, even you know, and and although, I mean, the Protestant Reformation 
should really have changed people's views about what you do with the body and the fact that it matters whether what you do anything. Very few people really subscribe to that, to the extreme view that burial is, is, is unimportant. I mean, you know, even, um, even the most religious Protestants have some view about being buried in the proper way and in the proper place. And it's not till you get really the Quakers in the later 17th century that you have a real challenge to the, the standards of Anglican burial. Thank you so much, Banes. It's been a, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, thank you for for supporting the festival for your time. And uh, well, I hope uh, we can live behind this pandemic as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see Good you. Bye. Thank you.